My name is Jody. I'm on the preaching team. I am not on the worship team. That's because the wisdom and discernment of the worship team says, stay in your lane, Jody. But I am going to do an experiment this morning. Let's pretend right now that I am the conductor of the greatest choir in all of South Orange County. And you are the great choir of South Orange County. So I'm wearing a black tuxedo with tails. Can you see it? You guys are all dressed in black. You feel pretty good. Now you're going to watch me. It's just four simple notes. Four simple notes. We'll start with the G. Everybody tune. Mm, come on, come on, tune. Mm, da, 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 da. Now, everybody. Da. Louder. How do you know that? What was that? Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right. How do you know that? I mean, we all know those four notes, and we know it's part of a, a, an incredible symphony written 240-something years ago. The symphony, when fully played, is two and a half hours long. It's absolutely brilliant. If you've ever experienced a symphony, I mean, it, it can just change your emotion. It can move you. Musicians, professional musicians and conductors, they've studied this symphony over and over again, even though they've heard it many, many times. They discover new things and nuances. And in fact, Beethoven actually references other composers in his fifth symphony. So it starts out so simple, just looking like four notes. But then you look at what he actually composed, you think of all the instruments, the woodwinds, the bassoons, the violins, the cellos. Everything's got a part, and it all comes together to create an incredible movement. Jonah is a lot like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. There is so much architecture, design, and brilliance in the two and a half pages in your Bible, maybe four if you've got the big font, there's so much there for us to see. We all know the basics. Da, 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 da. Yeah, there was Jonah, there was a fish, there was a whale, he was kid, vomited out. And... But once we get into the details and we see the architecture, we see everything that the author was pointing to, it's just a brilliant book. I've created just a, a relatively simple chart to show you uh, the structure of Jonah. You can see A, B, C, and it repeats twice. It starts with, in, in both cases, verse 1, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And then the first time, of course, Jonah flees, and he encounters a bunch of pagans. These pagans are on the ship. They change their behavior because of their encounter with Jonah. And then Jonah prays, A, B, C. And then the A, B, C repeats again. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And Jonah, again, encounters a bunch of pagans, this time the Ninevites. And the pagans change their behavior. And once again, Jonah prays. And then we have this section D, which we're going to be exploring today, on how God teaches Jonah a lesson. So that's where we've been. And you get an idea in section D where we are going. So let's dive in. Did you get it? Dive in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick up in uh, chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they, that is the Ninevites, turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. It's shocking. <laughs> Getting angry at God, getting angry because good things happen to these people. But if I'm honest, I often act a lot like Jonah. If I'm being authentic with you and if you're being authentic with me, which is one of the core values we have at this church is authenticity with self. We Admit when we don't quite have it figured out or maybe we are not living like what's written in the text. That's because we don't have it figured out. We're trying to figure it out. And this is a safe place for you to ask those questions about God and faith. This is a safe place where you go, I'm not sure I get or understand. In fact, we like to say this is the kind of faith 
a place where you can belong before you really maybe 100% believe. So we welcome you here. And if I'm being authentic with you, I can harbor a little bit of anger towards the groups of people. But I'm pretty smart because I've been a Christian for 55 years and I know we're not supposed to show that anger, right? So I just don't show it. I don't talk about it. You should see my kitchen when I'm yelling at the TV. You should be there, right? I still have the hatred. It's just unexpressed hatred, and it's still not right. See, Jonah is a lot like a mirror. You can hold up that mirror, and you look at the, Every time I say, I am so glad I'm not like Jonah, one of those hateful, angry Christians, I'm acting just like Jonah. It's a very <sighs> convicting book. Bless you. And again. Jonah loved his country. By the way, Israel is never mentioned in the book. Jonah absolutely loved his country, and he was mad at the Ninevites, the people of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, because of what they had done to Israel in the past. You know, I'm thinking, until chapter 3, I'm not sure. We don't read that Jonah ever personally met a Ninevite. In fact, he probably kept his far distance. Maybe that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. I'm not sure he ever personally knew a Ninevite, but boy, he sure hated all of them. He made it very, very personal, even though he probably never had a personal encounter with them. So, picking up in verse 2, Jonah, he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Do you see the self-justification here? I knew you were a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding. I knew it. Now, here's how did he know that? There's some hyperlinks in what Jonah is saying here to other passages in the text. The, the first part where he says, slow to anger and abounding in love, that's a direct quote from Exodus. Direct quote from Exodus. And then the part about if a nation repents from evil, uh, I will re uh, relent and not inflict uh, upon it the disaster I had planned. God says that in Jeremiah. The brilliance of this book pointing back to other parts of the Bible and it just repeating patterns and we see the similarities. Here's the deal. Jonah was able to quote from his Bible. Jonah had a lot of information about his Bible. Jonah had a lot of information about God. But he didn't seem to understand relationship with God. I wonder if we can do that too sometimes. Get a lot of information and argue over dividing the text and the proper conjugation of verbs in Hebrew or Greek. And the important thing is the relationship. The important thing is the relationship. Picking up in verse 3, Jonah, he is so angry. Now, Lord, take away my life. Talk about an adult temper tantrum. And I don't know if he literally meant it at this point or if the, you know, take my life is hyperbole, but he's throwing a full-on temper tantrum. He, how many times have I said, I can't take it, I'd rather die than... We need to be careful what we say. If any of you have ever been a parent, it, you may have seen the temper tantrum. Uh, just uh, maybe one time about 25 years ago, maybe there was a small boy, uh, maybe a son of ours, maybe uh, a really well-behaved young man, maybe we were in a grocery store, maybe that grocery store is on Marguerite and Olympiad, and maybe... Uh, his provider, also known as Bernice, my wife, uh, said no to something, and maybe he went face down on the ground, pounding hands and fists into the ground, throwing a full-on temper tantrum. And it was pretty cute, to be honest, because it was so uncharacteristic. Now, Bernice might have been just a little bit embarrassed by the behavior, but she didn't get angry at him. She saw that there was an issue there was a lesson. There was an opportunity. 
And so she took the cart over to the uh, clerk and said, I will be back after a teachable moment in the minivan or the parking lot. And um, she started to teach him a lesson, not out of anger, but out of compassion. Because she loves that son. So it is with Jonah. See, thus far, we've seen the compassion that God has on the Ninevites, but he also has it on Jonah. Jonah's in his face, and God is not smiting him like a mighty smiter. God is about to show him love through a lesson. So the first question that God asked Jonah, and the first question that Bernice asked in our hypothetical situation with our hypothetical son. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right? Does it serve you well? Not why are you angry? We can all answer that question. Why am I angry? Because the day one or they, uh, why are you angry? No, is it right for you to be angry? I like the uh, Hebrew translation. Uh, this is done by a, uh, Dr. Tim Mackey, is it good that there is, there is heat anger in you or toward you? See, when we have anger, it burns. I mean, there's, that's a perfect adjective. It burns. And the problem with burning is somebody's going to get burned. Somebody's going to get heat, heat anger. And often it's you carrying that, not the other person. So what's happening here is God is inviting Jonah and he's inviting us to get curious, not furious. Does it do good for you to be angry? Why are you so angry, really? Are you hurt? Really? Does being angry help anybody? Does your anger help anybody? This points back to another Bible story, Cain. Uh, Cain and Abel. Cain was jealous of his brother Abel. Cain got really angry. And God comes to Cain and says, does it do right for you to have heat anger? It's the same exact quote. Does it do you right to have heat anger? Watch it or sin is crouching at the door and it will take over. It wants to control you. And it did. The very first homicide recorded in history is Cain killing his brother Abel because he held on to that heat anger. It's not good. Paul warns that anger is dangerous and can lead to sin, which leads to more anger, which leads to more sin in this downward spiral. He says, in your anger, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. He's trying to get a foothold so he can climb in and take control. Uh, but maybe, you know, you've heard it said, well, there's righteous anger. I mean, they're, the world's messed up. Jody, haven't you seen? And we have a right to be angry, and we need to be angry because if we're not angry, then people aren't going to, they're not going to be changed. Righteous anger is not defined in the New Testament. I looked. It's not there. In fact, the exact opposite is there. James, the brother of Jesus, addressed this when he writes, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. But wait a minute, Jesus, he got angry, he turned over the tables and he had the whip and he did all that stuff. Yes, he did. And God, I mean, Jonah, the whole thing, he said he was angry and, and he was gonna, yes. They have divine anger. I mean, it's okay to be angry, but it's not good. Anger and hurt, those are real feelings, but we need to get rid of them before devil can Take a foothold and try to control us. And by the way, remember, Paul told us what God said in the Old Testament, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not our job. It's not our job. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And Jonah, he's pretty angry. He's got righteous, self-righteous indignation. And he was hell-bent on being right, which is what chapter 2 is all about. When he descended into the depths of Sheol, he was hell-bent on being right. 
our anger can take us to our own personal hell. Is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry at those people that don't vote like us and maybe don't uh, uh, look at marriage the same way we do or maybe don't mask like us or vaccine like us or maybe they weren't born in our same geography or cheer for the same teams as us? Is it right for you to be angry against all those people? Again, holding up the mirror, I visited churches that maybe don't worship the way we do Maybe they preach a little differently than we do. Maybe they focus more on uh, legal aspects or righteousness and self-righteousness than grace. Or maybe they focus all on grace and not enough on, you know, hey, we still got some work to do to help advance the kingdom. And you know what I do? I harbor resentment towards them because in my Jonah judgment, they're not doing it right. Man, I'm glad I'm not like Jonah. I have Jonastic tendencies. <laughs> Somehow, someway, Jonah, a prophet of Israel, forgot the purpose of his job as a prophet and of his nation. He loved his nation. I think he made his nation his idol because he was more concerned about his nation than he was about the role of his nation to bless all other nations, including Assyria, including the people of Nineveh. Verse five, so how does he respond? He goes out east. Verse five, Jonah had gone out and he sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, and he sat in its shade, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, and he made it grow up over Jonah and gave shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So what happens? He goes east to the city, and he builds himself a tent, or uh, the, the, the version of the text that Brick read earlier, it said a booth. Now, this was a tradition from Israel, going back to the Old Testament, that they honored every year. They would build temporary shelters. They would leave their homes, and they would build these temporary shelters, and they would stay in them for a week to recall that they were brought out of Israel, and God protected them. He provided temporary shelters. He was their provider. And so Jonah, kind of ironically, is doing a a, a religious thing, and he's setting up this booth, this temporary shelter. And frankly, the evidence would, it doesn't say, but the evidence would suggest he's sitting there with his arms folded, tapping his foot, and he's counting down to day 40. And he's just waiting. Are they going to keep repenting? Is God going to keep relenting? Or is the hammer going to fall? And he's wanting the hammer to fall. I'm so glad I'm not like Jonah. And waiting for those bad guys to get it and allow the hammer to fall. You ever do that? I I do that. I kind of root against other people, maybe sometimes. We'll use a sports analogy. I know not everybody's into football, not everybody's into sports, but forgive the analogy. It's just so simple. My team, I have certain teams that I root for and I love, and I want them to win. And it's great when they do, and I'm all excited, and I have friends that also cheer for those teams, and we enjoy that together. The problem is, when I cheer for my team, that's awesome, but sometimes I cheer against other teams. Well, I guess that's okay in a sports world where if one team wins, another team loses. I've done this in business as well, right? I cheer for my company I root against the other company because it's kind of a zero-sum world. If they get a dollar of revenue, then I'm not getting a dollar of revenue because there's only so many T-shirts or shoes that can be sold coming from the industries in which I worked. My team, the one I cheer for, tends to be the, it's the Baltimore Ravens. I love the Baltimore Ravens. If there's a rivalry in that conference, it's the Baltimore Ravens against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm showing my gymnastic tendencies. Here's the problem. It's one thing to root against a team. 
It's another when you extend that from the team to the fans and you start rooting against the fans. It's one thing to maybe not be a big fan of a political philosophy. It's another thing when you're rooting against the fans of that political philosophy. Let me show you a picture of the biggest Pittsburgh Steeler fan in our church. If you know Marty Mance, who's on our staff, there is not a more loving, gentle, kind individual. There's not. Now, here's the deal. Here's what I've learned. I've learned by getting to know Marty Mance, who happens to be a fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers, that I can actually be happy when the Pittsburgh Steelers win because I know it makes Marty happy. I'm still learning, but you get the principle. You get the principle. I'm just so glad I'm not like Jonah. Notice what God is doing here. It says he provided. Well, actually, uh, I think I skipped ahead. Uh, Yeah, go to verse 7. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than live. So kind of interesting. You go back to chapter 1, Jonah flees. God provides a strong wind to blow the, the, the boat off course. Then he provides a fish to save Jonah from the depths. And then he provides a leafy plant to go along uh, uh, with what Jonah provided for himself to provide shade. And then it says here, he provides, it's very deliberate, he provides a worm and he provides another strong wind. I don't think God is doing this to make him miserable. God is providing by taking away so that he can give Jonah a lesson, much like you parents have provided a lesson to your children by taking things away, maybe time out or maybe certain privileges. God is showing compassion. He's not trying to hurt Jonah. In fact, a little bit of discomfort for Jonah right now will go a long way to Jonah's true joy potential joy in the future. Now, I'm not saying that every time we feel uncomfortable or any time something bad happens to us, that God is in it. But God can use it. Very, very often we pray, God, get me out of this situation. Maybe it would be better to pray, God, what do you want me to get out of this situation? And God had a lesson for Jonah. God has a lesson for Jonah. I've had things taken from me. I uh, was very, very proud, very, very happy to work for the fastest growing company, not just in the country, in the world. Got to be one of the early founding uh, executives at that. And I wore my... Christianity on my sleeve in Baltimore, Maryland. I was known as the Holy Roller Executive. And that company grew and grew and grew and enormously successful. And frankly, it grew to the point where it was a little bit beyond my experience and abilities. And so the company, rightfully, it was within their rights, came to me and said, Jody, we're going to go a different direction. And we're inviting you to pursue other opportunities. It's just business. It's not personal. It felt awfully personal. And it hurt. And I sought counsel and counseling. And actually, I've learned since I had made that role, being an executive at fastest growing company in North America, 26 straight quarters of double-digit growth. I had made that role and that company an idol. 
And so God blew it down. <laughs> he took it away. He used people, took it away. And I learned, and I'm better. I'm truly better because of God's provision. God provides for Jonah's benefit even if it created temporary discomfort. God cares more about Jonah's character than he does his comfort. In verse 9, so gently again, God asked Jonah the question, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Again, he's inviting them to be curious instead of furious. It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Cain's anger led to his brother's death, and now Jonah's anger is killing himself. Jonah's anger is putting him in a prison. Jesus said, do not judge, or you will be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Jonah judged, Jonah condemned, and he condemned himself. He put himself in his own prison, a life sentence. He was not living the life he could have lived. He had put himself in his own prison. Verse 10, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to, make, tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. Should I not have more concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Jonah needed to move to humanize those he had dehumanized. We need to. I need to move to humanize those that I've demonized. I'm so glad I'm not like Jonah. And not being able to tell right hand from left, I mean, it's not that they didn't know right from wrong, because clearly, right at the outset of Jonah, God was angry at their behavior, and they knew it, and they repented from it, so they know right from wrong. But they don't know right from left. They don't know which way to go. They're lost. They're like sheep that have gone astray. They need a shepherd. And Jonah could have been that shepherd, but he's sitting out east of Nineveh with his arms folded, waiting for it to fall. We're ambassadors. We Christians, we're called to be shepherds to the lost sheep. We can't sit on the sidelines and just tap our feet and wait for it to fall. We have a role to play. We need to be in the city. And that last part about the animals or the cattle, I think God, I think the author put that there to crack us up. I really do. Because what God's saying is, look, Jonah, you care about plants. You don't yet care about homo sapiens people, so how about we just get you to care for the mammals? Can you just take a step that far? We don't know how Jonah ends. It's left unresolved, and it's left unresolved on purpose. We don't know what happens to Jonah. Does he finally get it right? I don't know. But the question still remains, and the question is the one we have to answer. See, the author has made this book. It's gone from being about Jonah to being very, very personal. It's about you. How are you going to answer this question? How are you going to answer this question? Does God have the right to help people of which you do not approve? Now, I guess really the question is, who determines approval? If you're exploring Christianity and you're not sure and maybe somebody stood at a place like this and, or on a street corner or somebody's posted something that told you you're not worthy and God's mad at you and he's going to smite you, almighty oh smiter, and all that stuff, I'm sorry. You see what God did to Nineveh? He warned them so that he could love them. And God warns us today so that he could love us. This is about grace. 
This is about forgiveness. And today, we're going to get to celebrate a sacrament of baptism, celebrating people that have found that joy and that love, and they don't have to be angry. They don't have to be worried about their past behavior. And if you're a Christian, is it good for you to be angry? Does it serve you well to be angry? Are you putting yourself in your own prison? Are you hell-bent on being angry? All Jonah seemed to want was his comfort at the expense of everybody else. Are we so comfortable? Are we sitting on our sofas, yelling at the TV? when we could turn off the TV and talking to people in the community. We're going to do something a little bit different today because of the format of this service with the baptisms that are coming, and I can't wait. But between now and then, because this story is unresolved, because this story has moved from being about Jonah, it's now about God, and it's now about you. It's now personal. The story is unresolved so that we will make a personal resolution to the question. We are all made in the image of God. Mankind is made in the image of God. God is a trinity. God is inherently in relationship. If we, all of mankind, are to reflect God, we have to be in relationship. We cannot cut one group out and say they don't belong. Then we're not reflecting Imago Dei. We're not reflecting the image of God. So as the music starts, and as you hear the opening of this song, and as the lights dim and come down again, I would ask you to take time just like Dr. Ken Baugh asked us last week, who's that person, if it's personal, that comes to mind that we need to be praying for? Maybe they'll change, but mostly we can change. And who's that group that we've made personal? Can we pray for them and pray for ourselves? Are we ready to finally be set free from our anger? Pray with me, Father God, this message is hundreds and hundreds of years old, but it speaks to us as if it was written this morning. Help us to be set free of anger and to recognize and be grateful that you love everybody and help us to remember that at one point we were all in Nineveh.